All right, hello and welcome back. This is Code Dive 2023. And uh, just a quick reminder, yes, it is our birthday and the 10th anniversary of our conference. It's time for our next speaker and he will be talking about Swift Abbey resilience. Now, Victor Chura is a principal engineer on the Visual C++ team, helping to improve various tools. Prior to joining Microsoft, uh, he programmed in C++ professionally for 20 years. One of his hobbies today is modernizing aging code bases, and Victor has built open source tools to help this process, which he's coined Clang Power Tools. He's a regular guest at the computer science department in his alma mater, which is the University of Craiova in his native Romania. So let's have a round of applause for Victor Chura. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me again uh, to the anniversary edition of CodeDive. I'm happy to be here, happy to see familiar faces again. So let's let's get started. Um, hi everyone. It's kind of hard to see you. If so, if you have a question or want to say something, just shout it out because <laughs> it's kind of hard to see with the li house lights. So um, although you might see um, a company there uh, by my name and you heard the intro, I'm not here representing the opinions, official uh, opinions of my employer. I'm just uh, a guy complaining about stuff. So uh, some of the things you're going to hear are uh, facts backed by uh, resources, evidence. Uh, some are just opinions uh, and take them uh, as is. And I, I'm very much interested to hearing uh, your opinions about the subjects that we're going to cover. So I do encourage this to be like a dialogue. Um, it's not necessary to wait until the end. Uh, we, you can or shout out a question or a comment even during, I don't mind. Uh, and even after the talk, do find me on the hallways, um, happy to chat about any of these things. So, uh, and by the way, this is, uh, I know in this track we've had space-related uh, talks, uh, and this is not one of those talks, but I do have some space here, but not the kind yeah, that you're thinking about. So. Two days ago, I was uh, in Berlin at Meeting C++ conference, and between sessions, I was really thirsty, so I grabbed, quickly grabbed two bottles out of the um, uh, fridge cooler on the hallways there. Can you notice how this might be related to today's topic? Anyone? It's a pretty big screen. Might be. I, I see people pointing, so I, I guess they figured it out. So th these two bottles, al although uh, identical in brand and content, uh, somehow came from different revisions in the factory. But they were together in the same fridge, and I didn't notice this until I actually opened them. This will be relevant to what we are going to talk about today. Uh, and by the way, uh, maybe uh, some of you um, came into the room because you saw Swift in the, in the title, and others maybe read the agenda and saw clear signs of C++ frustration there. So uh, this talk is sort of um, somewhere in the middle. So it's not exactly a Swift talk, uh, not your typical C++ talk. It's more of um, what can we learn from each other kind of talk, and uh, see what um, folks over the fence are doing. Can we leverage some of that? Uh, and instigate a discussion, of course. So what is ABI, anyway? Uh, ABI can mean a lot of different things to people. If you ask compiler engineers, uh, if you ask operating system engineers, they will tell you different things. Uh, if you will ask library developers, they will give you different uh, facets. Uh, they all comprise uh, or are under the same umbrella, so to speak. So um, it's not really platform. Uh, is it really hardware ABI? Yeah, in some degree. Calling conventions, sure. Uh, language, compilers, tool chains, and so on. And of course, the libraries that we're consuming. So I would say, in a general form, it's more about the details. Like, how do we fit pieces of code together? 
So ABI stability isn't technically a property of the programming language, although when people talk about these things and compare, they usually tag the uh, a programming language and they frame it in the context of a programming language, of course. But they of, more often than not, they mean it in the, in the context of, of the system, of the tool chain, of the, the platform that they're targeting with, with that tool chain. So it, it is definitely something defined by the platform that you're targeting. And in some cases, the platform owner might even require you slash guide you down the <laughs> blessed path uh, so that things just work. Um, if you're thinking about, for example, developing iOS applications, uh, the platform vendor is very opinionated, and the tools they provide for developers sort of force developers down a, the, a, the right path so that components can be independently evolved. And we can see what I mean by that. And of course, this becomes really important if we're talking about dynamic libraries. So if we're going to share stuff and not just link everything statically together. So I mentioned space, but not on the moon or anywhere else out there, rather in the finer details. So the, if we're talking about the layout of types, if we're talking about size, uh, alignment, stride for some types, uh, stride becomes important when you think about um, laying uh, such objects in arrays, if we're talking about um, uh, types that carry additional payloads, like enums in, in Swift, for example. Uh, so offset of and, and, and the type of fields of the nested objects, if we're thinking about aggregate structures, vtable entries, if we have uh, things like that. Um, and then we have calling conventions. Uh, and these might be really different in how uh, we, we handle the stack and how we pass uh, parameters around in functions and uh, how we expect to um, chain computation together in a procedural manner. And because um, we're mostly using linker technologies designed in the 70s, uh, name mangling is another consideration because we sort of have to make uh, these things uh, work uh, with sort of crude linkers. And when applicable to the programming language and, and framework itself, sometimes metadata is part of this story. So for C++ now, I'm going to constantly ping pong between C++ and, uh, and some of the Swift learnings. So for C++, uh, when we compile, we traditionally lay out some definition for uh, the types that we're building. And we have an implementation on the side, and we build uh, a, a, a unit out of this, and on some other side, we might uh, include these definitions because we want to consume these types. We want to use them some, somehow, and we build that in a separate uh, unit, separate artifact. And of course, we assume that at some point they will come together nicely. And I spent some time actually arranging those uh, gears so that they look they, that they fit nicely together and they just don't uh, mash up um, when connecting. So that's where parts of the tool chain get involved. And sometimes they help pinpoint problems, but more often than not, um, you might run into issues uh, when you least expect them. So binary compatibility, and we're talking about binary compatibility at this point, um, between separately compiled artifacts is an issue. And becomes even more so uh, if you're thinking about independently upgrading parts of a large um, project, large application. For example, you might have um, uh, some DLL, for example, that a third party provider uh, gave you, and you're consuming that DLL against a, a definition header file, and you're separately. Um, linking that to, to, to your application, and you might even want to evolve independently the tool chains that you're using to building these separate parts. For example, your vendor might have built uh, that module with a particular compiler, and you might be wanting to upgrade, and so on. And you kind of hope that things will just work together. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So why would you want uh, ABI stability? And by stability means it just works. Um, 
when you don't have to share the source code of the library you're building, let's say you're uh, the vendor, you're building some kind of module for some kind of system, and you don't want to share the source code for that thing, you're just uh, serving some uh, binary, pre-built binaries. Um, when you want to access, like I mentioned, the most recent version of the compiler for your library, when you just don't want to recompile the whole world. And of course, a very important issue when you think about um, security is the ability to patch things independently. Think about an operating system vendor that wants to service certain components in the operating system. And of course, the applications themselves link against those functionalities. They might consume those APIs and those functionalities. Uh, and you are not expected as user uh, or as application developer to constantly update and address all security vulnerabilities uh, of the libraries that you're depending on or the the, from the system operating system that you target. So the ability for the, the system provider to independently patch the system and for the applications to keep working after those uh, components have been patched is essential. Um, not every program is statically compiled. And it's not even possible sometimes. Uh, for example, in many systems, it's very desirable to share these libraries because of, of size of, of the actual payload. Uh, there are constrained systems or many, many applications on the system that might use the, a particular library. And if each one would carry a copy of, of that implementation, it would be just wasteful and prohibit uh, system servicing, of course. So multiple programs can share a library, and it's encouraged on many, many systems. So the question is, if you want these kinds of properties, when should you stabilize? Is there a perfect moment to stabilize? Um, if you're doing so, can you do it in a way that you don't shut the door on future improvements that can be made? by the compiler, by your library vendor, and so on, by the frameworks that you're consuming or depending on. Stabilizing too early, whatever that means, uh, you might miss on op optimization opportunities um, to get a faster, I don't know, calling convention or a better structure layout, more optimal for memory access patterns, uh, improve the way some standard library facility works. I'm going to show a concrete examples there. So mind you that all these things are not impossible problems, but they're just very hard problems. And, and the reason why I, I want to do and raise awareness and I do these kinds of uh, talks is that somehow people sort of gave up uh, because they, they, they think it's an impossible problem because of how the system and the ecosystem is fragmented about how our tools work, the language and evolution and the process is involved. So they sort of gave up on either stabilizing or figuring out an evolution plan. So these are very hard problems, but they're not impossible problems. We just have to invest a lot of time to deal with them. So developers want to evolve their software libraries without breaking the ABI, so that they can add new functionality and they don't break their users um, that don't want to recompile everything. Uh, so that you can actually fix bugs. Some bug fixes require changes that would break this agreement between consumer and producer of a particular piece of uh, binary artifact. Or there might be performance improvement opportunities uh, that we can pursue, and I have some examples to share, uh, that cannot be done without breaking this contract. So. A lot of these activities, of course, can break ABI, like adding a field in a class, adding a virtual function, if there's such a thing there, uh, reusing some existing padding or reordering, reordering some fields for better uh, uh, cache locality, or any, any of these kinds of things. So what do authors do? Uh, I, I looked at some of the traditional um, programming languages in the system space. Um, and if you look, Golang, doesn't have a plan here that they don't intend to stabilize any API. No commitments. Rust, no. Carbon, no. Zig, no. C++, we don't know what we want. Uh, and Swift, very much yes. Uh, 
um, and not from the beginning. Uh, but this was a, a very important goal for, for uh, Swift because they really wanted library evolution to happen in a non-breaking uh, manner. They wanted the ability and flexibility to evolve their, their systems without breaking existing users. And we did, they didn't get that from version one. Uh, this process that I'm going to describe came only in Swift 5, so many years after uh, the initial designs and plans. So it, it can be done after the fact. Some quotes there. Uh, by the way, all of these are quotes from their respective resources. So a carbon non-goal is stable API for the entire language and library. Um, for Rust ABI, they just closed the issue after lengthy discussions. Like, this is not a concern for us. We have other priorities. Zig, again, sure, we support C ABI and uh, C, C FFI and compatibility, but that's about it. We don't commit to anything else. Go, internal ABI specification. This ABI is unstable. This is what it says on the website. And it will change between Go versions. No promises. Deal with it. So, and I'm, I'm again, I'm not saying these community and these um, designers, uh, they don't know what they're doing. They just have different core priorities, different, different design choices and principles. So they, they need to focus. They, you have limited capacity, bandwidth, of course, and you have to focus on your priorities. Each of them is a package. So that's what we have to do. We have to think what really matters for us. Where should we focus all our energy? So going back to C++, <laughs> we have a, a very old technique uh, that is, seems very suitable as an, <laughs> as an insulation uh, mechanisms to achieve superior ABI stability. Um, like always, one, one more level of interaction solves all our problems, right? It's just, it's not a very scalable approach, and it's definitely not a performant approach, because you would have to incur interaction in all cases, even if you, in, in areas and in boundaries where you actually know and, and control the layout of the types. So why pay the cost all the time? And of course, it's ugly and definitely not scales nicely. We have a standard any, so seems like it, it, could, it could fit the bill, right? You raise every trace that you ever had the type system there, right? Uh, and of course, this one too comes with a performance cost. So I'm not saying it's not a good tool, but not for this. And the all-time champion of ABI stability, C. B by the way, this is not carbon. It's just the old C that you know. So traditionally, this has been the ling lingua franca of interop. Almost every system language out there would have like some kind of means of linking against C so that you can consume all the libraries out there so that you can interrupt with other uh, programming languages and binary artifacts. So this seems like a fairly good uh, option, right? It's just it's at a very low denominator. Definitely not something ergonomic or safe. If you think back to the 90s, I don't know how many uh, older programmers are in the room. I'm not going to make you raise your hands or anything. Uh, but if you think back at COM, for example, um, I think um, if you've suffered through that period, uh, I think you can remember techniques to uh, make breaking changes uh, and evolving uh, the things that you're building uh, and enforcing those changes gradually uh, on your users by making API changes to signal that something has been broken in the contract, in the binary compatibility contract with the consumers. So you would have uh, interfaces, and by the way, those suffixes, two, three, four, whatever, they're not just like fake slide names. This is how things looked in, and still look in COM. I, I have vivid memories of using interfaces that had a four or five at the end. So 
when you wanted to add one more function, you couldn't just modify the existing protocol, the existing interface. You would just invent a new one that had the extra function. <laughs> so this is a mechanism, but this requires put a burden on your consumers because they have to build against a new API now because you changed something in the implementation. And maybe they didn't really want the extra thing, but maybe they did. Or a more unstructured way of thinking about these kinds of things, like um, Objective-C had with message send APIs, where type erasure was everywhere and everything was dynamic. So I interactions everywhere. Th uh, think about having a standard any almost everywhere, right? You could in intercept messages and uh, rewire them differently and map things dynamically. So very loosey approach of uh, handling these kinds of things. It works. Um, gonna stop for a moment to uh, talk about why, maybe. And I have just a few quotes here. Um, some of them, I, I think they're quite juicy. I really like this one, like uh, thinking about we want to break ABI uh, compatibility because we want to fix the standard library for C++. And committing to a, an ABI is like admitting that the standard library is aiming to be the McDonald's. It's everywhere, technically solves the problem, right? No longer hungry, but it's not exactly quality food, right? Uh, so it's about the, the same thing. Uh, you kind of want to have the standard library to be something that you want to use, not that you have to use. So you want it to be performant. You want the best implementation for mutex, for example, or for an unordered container. So stable API, ABI means you link against the platform API, shared library, including the standard library. So talking about stability and evolution without talking about the standard library itself, it's, just meaning, it's a meaningless exercise. You do want to have a strategy to evolve uh, the standard library and think about the consequences of this on your users. So have a, you cannot have stability because that prohibits evolution and improvement. And you cannot just blindly modify things and not think about a migration path for, you, for your users. So you have to have a plan. And that's what I'm trying to highlight here. So a stable C++ ABI is useless for platform uh, if it doesn't cat encompasses the standard library, of course. So sort of the, the bottom line is that C++ remains the king of mixed singles, uh, signals and ambivalent behavior here. On the one hand, we don't have an ABI re resilience model, so it's not officially st stable. C++ will not officially commit to guaranteeing ABI stability. It's not specified anywhere. We just pretend that it is. Um, the committee, the C++ committee, will reject any proposal that would cause ABI breaks in existing components. Well, not exactly reject, but just ignore. Um, and implementers uh, will not change and improve library components because it could cause ABI uh, breaks for clients. So whenever such a change would be desired, if it's an ABI break, cannot do it, sorry. And yes, I do know I represent an implementer here, but again, these are my opinions. So there was a discussion right before the pandemic in February 2020. It was the last in-person meeting of the committee in Prague uh, before the pandemic. And this was the hot topic of that meeting. Uh, whether to break ABI or not, and whether we should have an official stance on that. So they sort of decided not to, sort of. Uh, you're going to see the subtleties. Um, just a quote there, I'll let you read it. So the ABI discussions in Prague sort of went this way. The committee is not in favor of an ABI break in C++ 23. And by the way, C++23 officially shipped. The committee is in favor of an ABI break in a future version of C++. When? We don't know. Maybe in 20 years? We don't know. But it's on, it's on the table. The committee will take time to consider 
proposals requiring an ABI break, read as in ignore. And will not promise stability forever. And sure, as always, for C++, we want to prioritize performance over stability. So that's where we are. Uh, people, when we talk about this problem, people usually uh, cite one very known example, and that is a standard string from the pre-C++ 11 days. And I, uh, I, I grabbed this slide from um, in a recent keynote by Herb Sutter, and it has a few more examples. But I'm going to stick with the string one. Are people aware of the string, standard string problem in C++ 11? GCC, OK, I see a few hands, not a lot. OK, I'll quickly uh, recap. So pre-C++ 11, the standard string implementation in GCC was uh, copy on write for performance reasons, of course. Uh, in C++11, once we got move semantic into the language and in the implementation of standard string, this became incompatible with any copy on write implementation. So on the one hand, you had all your users who were consuming that type relying in, on its behavior of copy on write, and that affects the layout and the ABI of, of the type. And on the other hand, you want standard conformance. So you cannot claim to be a C++11 conformal compiler if you're not using move semantics for standard string. So what do you do? So that was the beginning of a fragmentation in the user base of uh, that library for lib standard C++, where they actually had two implementations. And you had to opt out uh, or opt in into one of them. I don't remember. For a while, the old one was the default. Doesn't matter. You had to choose. So this lasted for more of more than ten years, until they claim there there are no more users on the old implementation, right? So these kinds of things take a long time to move users along, and this is the sort of argument that you get when you say, okay, let's be disruptive. Let's let's just break things and fix things, and people will just adopt them. So uh, right after that uh, uh, committee, C++ committee meeting in Prague, uh, Corentin wrote this um, very nice article, The Day the, C the Standard C++ Library Died. I highly recommend that you read it. It has very nice examples. It's not as tragic as it sounds, but it's a very good article. Because it does have consequences on the library that we're using and what implementers can do with it. So talking about quality of implementation fixes. So we could make standard regex faster or add UTF-8 support for, to it. I think we all know how crappy are the standard regex implementations, right? Uh, making an ordered map faster or have the ability to swap out the hashing algorithm, right? Have some flexibility there. There are many, many, um, many associative hash lookup tables out there, many open source implementations. And even with the existing API for unordered map, with slight changes, uh, slight changes to, to the contract, to the specification of standard unordered map, we could achieve a much better performance in, in, in existing implementation. But that would be a breaking change for the users. Better conformance, some implementations are intentionally not fully conformant in some subtle ways, uh, and they cannot really fix those. Um, of course, we can tweak existing uh, library types by messing with their layouts. And one interesting thing that ties a bit with calling conventions, and this is not really a library thing, but it's very relevant for performance and the code gen. Uh, for example, for standard span, string view, unique pointer, um, when you sort of want these to be spilled into registers when they're passed around as arguments to functions. And you want to avoid uh, having these in, in memory. And given the how language handles and how various calling conventions are handled, for example, x64, um, 
there's, there's some overhead here. So you cannot really say these are pure zero overhead uh, abstractions because they're not spilled into registers, not all the time. So if you actually do this exercise, which is a very simple exercise, and look in Compiler Explorer at the output, you're going to see that uh, they end up in, in memory. Um, improving implementations of shared pointer, for example. I'm just picking some random examples. This is not an exhaustive list, of course. Improving the performance of standard mutex, right? Do you, do you actually do, do you know that on Windows, the, the implementation of shared mutex is actually faster than standard mutex? Are you aware of this story? It's a much more complex uh, API, for sure, but it's much faster. And the reason is that it's newer. Shared mutex is much newer. Uh, as as a, uh, a standard, whereas standard mutex is C++ 11. And at the time, the implementation had to support Windows XP, for example. And because you had such a broad range of uh, target platforms and operating systems, you had to use appropriate synchronization primitives so that they work on all these systems, right? The implementation had to do sort of a common denominator thing. Later on, when XP, uh, Windows XP was not no longer a requirement, uh, and it was the situation with shared mutex, which came much later, the implementation could use synchronization primitives, like operating system synchronization primitives, which are much more efficient. So it's much faster. Can we change standard mutex now? Sure, we could, but that's a breaking change. It's an ABI break, because those structures that we would need to use in the implementation would be different, different layout, different types, different size. So we have to wait until we can actually do it, until we can actually break this contract with the users. Until then, we're stuck with a slower implementation, right? These are just some examples. And uh, I put a link there where it says faster, where you can see actual details. I don't have time to go into the details now. So again, I'm going back to the choice thing, design choices. What do we optimize for? So for languages like C++, Rust, Carbon, Zig, whatever, they usually want fast code, right? We rely on heavy inlining and further optimization opportunities that come from aggressive inlining. We want CPU utilization. We want to saturate all the cores, everything, right? This is what we like. We mostly rely on static linking for <laughs> API compatibility reasons, mostly, right? But there are other choices out there. For example, Swift more often than not favors smaller code. Um, they, they favor smaller code because of uh, instru the instruction cache to be more, more friendly with the instruction cache, but also to fit into devices. Uh, these binary payloads do add up, and uh, Apple has some really big frameworks, and many of them. And sometimes they have to fit constrained environments in a watch, for example, right? And they tend to favor CPU power usage. So how you lay out cogen, and it, they're much more obsessed about the power consumption rather than just full saturation, of course, all the time. Uh, how many people are aware of outlining? What outlining? I, I know all of you know what inlining is, but outlining? Anyone? Okay, I'm going to do a brief aside, very brief one. Yeah, and of course, um, Swift really cares about dynamic linking and using shared libraries because they want to be able to service and update the OS without having uh, requiring users to recompile their applications, right? And because of the size thing. They, if every app on your phone would just ship the Swift standard library and all the frameworks that they rely on, uh, you would need much more expensive phones. So outlining. There are various strategies uh, for code generation in compilers. Um, and some of them, and many, many people are just obsessed with the O2 and O3 ones, of course. You want the best performance possible, right? 
But if you care more about size, there are op options. For example, the OS thing is a fairly old one. But a much newer, uh, much more newer development is the OZ flag in LLVM, for example. Where, and by the way, there's very nice presentations if you want to like, nerd out and see all the details here. Uh, I've linked two very nice presentations. The first one is just on this topic. I think it's a shorter one. The second one has more things in it, but uh, a bit more detailed and a bit newer. So what this optimization pass does, it's actually trying to identify similar code patterns in the code and replace those with fake functions that they would call in the, in the code gen. So the, it, it's the opposite of inlining. And the purpose is to reduce code size. So it just tries to identify sequence, similar sequences, sort of like a uh, compressor would do, right? Very cool, th very cool technology. So uh, for those who are not familiar with Swift, this is like, like the very basic intro, like the kinds of uh, parameters that uh, go into Swift. Like, uh, it's, an, it's a compiled language. It has to interrupt with Objective-C and its runtime. It does, has all the nice modern programming facilities in programming languages, strong emphasis on value types, um, and has both reference types for classes, the old uh, programming model from Objective-C. It handles things automatically through um, automatic reference counting and so on. So it's a fairly complex language. Uh, but it uh, serves, again, a very broad range of needs. What's important about this in this story is uh, it was a language designed for library evolution. So principles being make all promises explicit, delineate what can and cannot change in stable ABI, pro and provide a performance model that interacts only when necessary. And this is key. I'm not going to show you a lot of Swift code, very basic stuff. This is the, as complex as it gets. So for example, we might have a structure that we, we want to change, slightly tweak over time. For example, uh, we might reorder the fields there. Or we might add an optional field later on. By the way, question mark at the end just means optional. It's, just not, it's not like a, it's panicking or asking stuff. It means optional. So we might add a, an optional field, or we might reward our stuff, or we might change ID from integer to UUID or something. The kinds of thing you would want to do over time, right? So the size of the structure changes, the offset of the fields changes. So how we do deal with that? And on the consumer side of things, we're, we're composing, right? We have a, a, a teacher of the type person inside, right? So we need to know the size of that thing. We have an array of such things, right? So we need to know the stride and the size and everything. And we're actually referencing that thing with dot name there. So we need to know where it is in the structure. What's, what's the offset? So all these come into the type layout. And uh, the person library, if you imagine that you're implementing this as a, as a library thing, Think of standard string, or right? So the person library, when you're implementing the library, uh, the layout should be designed, and the usage and the code gen should be as if there is no interaction, as if you know all the intimate details of the type layout, because you're in that module. And you could generate metadata for your consumers. So when it's consumed externally by clients, who use that type in their implementation, they know how to deal with that in a resilient manner, without knowing the implementation details and the offsets of, of particular fields in the structure, right? So you can think of it as publishing all these kinds of information about alignment, size, and, and offsets, and everything. Like There's somewhere in a side thing, in a side metadata structure to be consumed by users. So in, in client code, so external code to the type we're defining, it all goes through an indirection, through this layout metadata layer. So access to a field is going through a, a, a read metadata, uh, and then adding the offset to the base object, and then doing all the uh, pointer manipulation to reach that uh, address. right? 
and to store it again, the same kind of thing. And even on the stack, not just for doing heap uh, references, right? On the library code, so when you're accessing that thing from the internal implementation, you don't want to pay that cost because you know the details. You're compiling the whole thing, right? So the, the metadata calculations that happen automatically in the runtime, you don't need to do those for internal consumption. And by the way, yes, LLVM can deal with these kinds of things even when dealing with the stack. So it can lay out things uh, at runtime, and you can do uh, dynamic, uh, uh, dynamically size things at runtime, even on the stack. And it's quite performant. So the, the way that Swift does this is by a concept known as resilient domains. So you can think of, it, of them as bubbles. For example, each green thing there is a resilient domain. So the personal library is a resilient domain. And the operating system and its frameworks maybe are resilient domain. And the application that I'm building could be another domain. Or I could have as many of these as I want. So what, does me what it means that a bubble or a domain for resilience is something that I compile together. So something that I always compile together, it makes a resilient domain. And, and the costs of this ABI stability should only be paid on those white arrows. So when, when I have to do calls between these bubbles, between these domains. But inside the bubbles, inside the resilience domains, I know I control that as a whole compilation unit. I can recompile it. When I change something, I can break everything because I assume it's private implementation and I know the layout of, of the structures inside. right? So you don't want to pay the cost every time. You don't want to do indirections all the time. Only when you're interfacing externally to, your, to the consumers of the types that you're building. So across resilience domains, you sort of project an image of a stable ABI because you, you go through these indirection mechanisms and your users go through this metadata um, information to, to get access to your private implementation, to the structure of your types. But within the resilience domain, everything is fair game. You can change anything. You pay no cost, no performance cost whatsoever. You access things directly. So optimizations need to be aware of these resilience domains and these boundaries. And of course, if you don't care, you can just think of everything as a big, one giant resilience domain, right? And then all bets are off, right? Nothing is stable. You don't pay for anything. So by default in Swift, a type that is defined in a dynamic library has a resilience layout, a resilient layout. So everything, size, alignment, stride, any, everything that is, isn't statically known to the application, and it must go through this runtime mechanism of using value witness tables at runtime to do these offset calculations and adjustments as appropriate. So value witness tables are just an implementation mechanism sort of similar to how vtables work, but for type layout. So uh, inside the boundaries of a dynamic library, for example, where all the implementation details are known, nothing is indirected. These witness tables are not consumed. And this is, by the way, efficiently cached. Uh, for example, when you load a dynamic library, when you deal open that library, when you want to load it, that's where all the computation happens once and it's cached. And all subsequent accesses are optimized, are just cached values. So the runtime knows how to deal with this. And it caches these things. So you amortize some of this cost, of course. Nothing is free, but it's an acceptable cost when you're dealing with, with these kinds of uh, in calls uh, between resilience domains, when you're doing client-provider uh, interaction. And this mechanism is the default. That's the best thing I like about it. So you have to opt out of your resi resilience if you don't want it. And there are various escape hatches, like you can explicitly mark a function as inline, and then, of course, no longer resilient because you just jammed the whole implementation into the client, client code gen, right? Anything you change into that function is no longer going to match with what was already, already compiled. 
because you just inserted that uh, code gen into, the, into your client code. Uh, but for performance reasons, you might want to do that. For types, you can mark a type as fixed layout, for example. For, you might think, it's a pair. What could possibly change, right? Famous last words, right? <laughs> So you might mark a, this structure as fixed layout, and then you never pay a cost for a resilience uh, change on this pair. But you also commit that you're never going to change it, right? Uh, and it comes with challenges. Uh, this is achieved with a fairly large runtime component in, in Swift. Again, it's a compiled language, but the runtime is not trivial. It's much more complex than a C runtime, for example, right? Uh, you have these runtime type layout things, handling of the metadata, windows tables, and so on. Generics complicate things, of course, uh, but Swift has ways of dealing with this even for generics through mechanisms as monomorphization and the opposite process of um, reabstraction, because you sort of need the, the reabstraction mechanism to be able to provide this resilience uh, around uh, generic components. Uh, I cannot go into details about these things, but um, I can recommend very good resources to read about reabstraction. So, for C++, I think there is a path forward, even for C++. So, for example, in libc++, um, and I've put a link there to the documentation, uh, libc++ aims to preserve a stable ABI without uh, subtle bugs when code is built under old ABI linked with code with new ABI and so on, right? And at the same time, the library wants to make ABI breaking improvements and fixes, and the user can opt in to get those. But it's sort of like a floodgate. You cannot discreetly opt in for, for things. So you can specify, for example, that uh, flag when compiling the library. Uh, and you can get some versions. For example, one means the current default, the stable implementation, or you can say two, give me the, the latest and greatest. I don't care, I want a, the best implementation. I don't care about uh, uh, stability. I'm compiling everything. And then when they're gonna stab stabilize this, the number two, then three will be the latest and greatest. That's the evolution plan at least. We're not there yet. But it's a sort of all or nothing. So it's a sort of a, floodgate kind of thing. It's, it's not very granular. You can read more about it in this very nice article. So there's a path forward. It's not perfect, but there's a path. And uh, I think we are officially don't have time per, for questions, because this is a sort of a short session format. But I'm right here for if you want to chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. Victor Chura.